Chapter 20. Of the unexampled and unheard of adventure which was achieved by the valiant Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha with less peril than any ever achieved by any famous knight in the world. It cannot be, senor, but that this grass is a proof that there must be hard by some spring or brook to give it moisture, so it would be well to move a little farther on, that we may find some place where we may quench this terrible thirst that plagues us, which beyond a doubt is more distressing than hunger. The advice seemed good to Don Quixote, and, he leading Rocinante by the bridle and Sancho the ass by the halter, after he had packed away upon him the remains of the supper, they advanced the meadow feeling their way, for the darkness of the night made it impossible to see anything, but they had not gone two hundred paces when a loud noise of water, as if falling from great rocks, struck their ears. The sound cheered them greatly, but halting to make out by listening from what quarter it came they heard unseasonably another noise which spoiled the satisfaction the sound of the water gave them, especially for Sancho, who was by nature timid and faint-hearted. They heard, I say, strokes falling with a measured beat, and a certain rattling of iron and chains that, together with the furious din of the water, would have struck terror into any heart but Don Quixote's. The night was, as has been said, dark, and they had happened to reach a spot in among some tall trees, whose leaves stirred by a gentle breeze made a low ominous sound, so that, what with the solitude, the place, the darkness, the noise of the water, and the rustling of the leaves, everything inspired awe and dread, more especially as they perceived that the strokes did not cease, nor the wind lull, nor morning approach, to all which might be added their ignorance as to where they were. But Don Quixote, supported by his intrepid heart, leapt on Rocinante, and bracing his buckler on his arm, brought his pike to the slope, and said, Friend Sancho, know that I by heavens will have been born in this our iron age to revive in it the age of gold, or the golden as it is called. I am he for whom perils, mighty achievements, and valiant deeds are reserved. I am, I say again, he who is to revive the knights of the round table, the twelve of France and the nine worthies, and he who is to consign to oblivion the platters, the tablons, the olivants and tarantes, the phoebuses and bilionizes, with the whole herd of famous knights errant of days gone by, performing in these in which I live such exploits, marvels, and feats of arms as shall obscure their brightest deeds. Thou dost mark well, faithful and trusty squire, the gloom of this night, its strange silence, the dull confused murmur of those trees, the awful sound of that water in quest of which we came, that seems as though it were precipitating and dashing itself down from the lofty mountains of the moon, and that incessant hammering that wounds and pains our ears, which things altogether each of itself are enough to instill fear, dread, and dismay into the breast of Mars himself, much more into one not used to hazards and adventures of the kind. Well, then, all this that I put before thee is but an incentive and stimulant to my spirit, making my heart burst in my bosom through eagerness to engage in this adventure, arduous as it promises to be, therefore tighten Rocinante's girths a little, and God be with thee, wait for me here three days and no more, and if in that time I come not back, thou canst return to our village, and thence, to do me a favour and a service, thou wilt go to El Toboso, where thou shalt say to my incomparable Lady Dulcinea that her captive knight hath died in attempting things that might make him worthy of being called hers. When Sancho heard his master's words he began to weep in the most pathetic way, saying, Senor, I know not why your worship wants to attempt this so dreadful adventure, it is night now, no one sees us here, we can easily turn about and take ourselves out of danger, even if we don't drink for three days to come, and as there is no one to see us, all the less will there be anyone to set us down as cowards. Besides, I have many a time heard the curate of our village, whom your worship knows well, preach that he who seeks danger perishes in it, so it is not right to tempt God by trying so tremendous a feat from which there can be no escape save by a miracle and heaven has performed enough of them for your worship in delivering you from being blanketed as I was, and bringing you out victorious and safe and sound from among all those enemies that were with the dead man, and if all this does not move or soften that hard heart, let this thought and reflection move it, that you will have hardly quitted this spot when from pure fear I shall yield my soul up to anyone that will take it. I left home and wife and children to come and serve your worship, trusting to do better and not worse, but as covetousness bursts the bag, it has rent my hopes asunder, for just as I had them highest about getting that wretched unlucky island your worship has so often promised me, I see that instead and in lieu of it you mean to desert me now in a place so far from human reach, for God's sake, master mine, deal not so unjustly by me, and if your worship will not entirely give up attempting this feat, at least put it off till morning, for by what the lore I learned when I was a shepherd tells me it cannot want three hours of dawn now, because the mouth of the horn is overhead and makes midnight in the line of the left arm. How canst thou see, Sancho, said Don Quixote, where it makes that line, or where this mouth or this occiput is that thou talkest of, when the night is so dark that there is not a star to be seen in the whole heaven. That's true, said Sancho, but fear has sharp eyes, 
and sees things underground, much more above in heavens, besides, there is good reason to show that it now wants but little of day. Let it want what it may, replied Don Quixote, it shall not be said of me now or any time that tears or entreaties turn me aside from doing what was in accordance with knightly usage, and so I beg of thee, Sancho, to hold thy peace, for God, who has put it into my heart to undertake now this so unexampled and terrible adventure, will take care to watch over my safety and console thy sorrow, what thou hast to do is to tighten Rocinante's girths well, and wait here, for I shall come back shortly, alive or dead. Sancho perceiving it his master's final resolve, and how little his tears, counsels, and entreaties prevailed with him, determined to have recourse to his own ingenuity and compel him, if he could, to wait till daylight, and so, while tightening the girths of the horse, he quietly and without being felt, with his ass halter tied both Rocinante's legs, so that when Don Quixote strove to go he was unable as the horse could only move by jumps. Seeing the success of his trick, Sancho Panza said. See there, senor. Heaven, moved by my tears and prayers, has so ordered it that Rocinante cannot stir, and if you will be obstinate, and spur and strike him, you will only provoke fortune, and kick, as they say, against the pricks. Don Quixote at this grew desperate, but the more he drove his heels into the horse, the less he stirred him, and not having any suspicion of the tying, he was fain to resign himself and wait till daybreak or until Rocinante could move, firmly persuaded that all this came of something other than Sancho's ingenuity. So he said to him, As it is so, Sancho, and as Rocinante cannot move, I am content to wait till dawn smiles upon us, even though I weep while it delays its coming. There is no need to weep, answered Sancho, for I will amuse your worship by telling stories from this till daylight, unless indeed you like to dismount and lie down to sleep a little on the green grass after the fashion of knights errant, so as to be fresher when day comes and the moment arrives for attempting this extraordinary adventure you are looking forward to. What art thou talking about dismounting or sleeping for? said Don Quixote. Am I, thinkest thou, one of those knights that take their rest in the presence of danger? Sleep thou who art born to sleep, or do as thou wilt, for I will act as I think most consistent with my character. Be not angry, master mine, replied Sancho, I did not mean to say that, and coming close to him he laid one hand on the pommel of the saddle and the other on the candle so that he held his master's left thigh in his embrace, not daring to separate a finger's width from him so much afraid was he of the strokes which still resounded with a regular beat. Don Quixote bade him tell some story to amuse him as he had proposed, to which Sancho replied that he would if his dread of what he heard would let him. Still, said he, I will strive to tell a story which, if I can manage to relate it, and nobody interferes with the telling, is the best of stories, and let your worship give me your attention, for here I begin. What was, was, and may the good that is to come be for all, and the evil for him who goes to look for it your worship must know that the beginning the old folk used to put to their tales was not just as each one pleased, it was a maxim of Cato Zonsorino the Roman, that says the evil for him that goes to look for it, and it comes as pat to the purpose now as ring to finger, to show that your worship should keep quiet, and not go looking for evil in any quarter, and that we should go back by some other road, since nobody forces us to follow this in which so many terrors affright us. Go on with thy story, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and leave the choice of our road to my care. I say then, continued Sancho, that in a village of Estremadura there was a goat shepherd, that is to say, one who tended goats, which shepherd or goat herd, as my story goes, was called Lope Ruiz, and this Lope Ruiz was in love with a shepherdess called Toralva, which shepherdess called Toralva was the daughter of a rich grazier, and this rich grazier. If that is the way thou tellest thy tale, Sancho, said Don Quixote, repeating twice all thou hast to say, thou wilt not have done these two days, go straight on with it, and tell it like a reasonable man or else say nothing. Tales are always told in my country in the very way I am telling this, answered Sancho, and I cannot tell it in any other, nor is it right of your worship to ask me to make new customs. Tell it as thou wilt, replied Don Quixote, and as fate will have it that I cannot help listening to thee, go on. And so, word of my soul, continued Sancho, as I have said, this shepherd was in love with Toralva the shepherdess, who was a wild buxom lass with something of the look of a man about her, for she had little mustaches, I fancy I see her now. Then you knew her? said Don Quixote. I did not know her, said Sancho, but he who told me the story said it was so true and certain that when I told it to another I might safely declare and swear I had seen it all myself. And so in course of time, the devil, who never sleeps and puts everything in confusion, contrived that the love the shepherd bore the shepherdess turned into hatred and ill will, and the reason, according to evil tongues, was some little jealousy she caused him that crossed the line and trespassed on forbidden ground and so much did the shepherd hate her from that time forward that, in order to escape from her, 
he determined to quit the country and go where he should never set eyes on her again. Turalva, when she found herself spurned by Lope, was immediately smitten with love for him, though she had never loved him before. That is the natural way of women, said Don Quixote, to scorn the one that loves them, and love the one that hates them, go on, Sancho. It came to pass, said Sancho, that the shepherd carried out his intention, and driving his goats before him took his way across the plains of Estremadura to pass over into the kingdom of Portugal. Toralva, who knew of it, went after him, and on foot and barefoot followed him at a distance, with a pilgrim's staff in her hand and a scrip round her neck, in which she carried, it is said, a bit of looking-glass and a piece of a comb and some little pot or other of paint for her face, but let her carry what she did, I am not going to trouble myself to prove it. All I say is, that the shepherd, they say, came with his flock to cross over the river Guadiana, which was at that time swollen and almost overflowing its banks, and at the spot he came to there was neither ferry nor boat nor anyone to carry him or his flock to the other side, at which he was much vexed, for he perceived that Toralva was approaching and, and would give him great annoyance with her tears and entreaties. However, he went looking about so closely that he discovered a fisherman who had alongside of him a boat so small that it could only hold one person and one goat. But for all that he spoke to him and agreed with him to carry himself and his three hundred goats across. The fisherman got into the boat and carried one goat over, he came back and carried another over, he came back again, and again brought over another, let your worship keep count of the goats the fisherman is taking across, for if one escapes the memory there will be an end of the story, and it will be impossible to tell another word of it. To proceed, I must tell you the landing place on the other side was miry and slippery, and the fisherman lost a great deal of time in going and coming. Still he returned for another goat, and another, and another. Take it for granted he brought them all across, said Don Quixote, and don't keep going and coming in this way, or thou wilt not make an end of bringing them over this twelve month. How many have gone across so far? said Sancho. How the devil do I know? replied Don Quixote. There it is, said Sancho, what I told you, that you must keep a good count, well then, by God, there is an end of the story, for there is no going any farther. How can that be? said Don Quixote, is it so essential to the story to know to a nicety the goats that have crossed over, that if there be a mistake of one in the reckoning, thou canst not go on with it? No, senor, not a bit, replied Sancho, for when I asked your worship to tell me how many goats had crossed, and you answered you did not know, at that very instant all I had to say passed away out of my memory, and, faith, there was much virtue in it, and entertainment. So, then, said Don Quixote, the story has come to an end. As much as my mother has, said Sancho. In truth, said Don Quixote, thou hast told one of the rarest stories, tales, or histories, that anyone in the world could have imagined, and such a way of telling it and ending it was never seen nor will be in a lifetime, though I expected nothing else from thy excellent understanding. But I do not wonder, for perhaps those ceaseless strokes may have confused thy wits. All that may be, replied Sancho, but I know that as to my story, all that can be said is that it ends there where the mistake in the count of the passage of the goats begins. Let it end where it will, well and good, said Don Quixote, and let us see if Rocinante can go, and again he spurred him, and again Rocinante made jumps and remained where he was, so well tied was he. Just then, whether it was the cold of the morning that was now approaching, or that he had eaten something laxative at supper, or that it was only natural, as is most likely, Sancho felt a desire to do what no one could do for him but so great was the fear that had penetrated his heart, he dared not separate himself from his master by as much as the black of his nail, to escape doing what he wanted was, however, also impossible. So what he did for peace's sake was to remove his right hand, which held the back of the saddle, and with it to untie gently and silently the running string which alone held up his breeches, so that on loosening it they at once fell down round his feet like fetters, he then raised his shirt as well as he could and bared his hindquarters, no slim ones. But, this accomplished, which he fancied was all he had to do to get out of this terrible strait and embarrassment, another still greater difficulty presented itself, for it seemed to him impossible to relieve himself without making some noise, and he ground his teeth and squeezed his shoulders together, holding his breath as much as he could, but in spite of his precautions he was unlucky enough after all to make a little noise, very different from that which was causing him so much fear. Don Quixote, hearing it, said, What noise is that, Sancho? I don't know, senor, said he, it must be something new, for adventures and misadventures never begin with a trifle. Once more he tried his luck, and succeeded so well, that without any further noise or disturbance he found himself relieved of the burden that had given him so much discomfort. But as Don Quixote's sense of smell was as acute as his hearing, and as Sancho was so closely linked with him that the fumes rose almost in a straight line, 
it could not be but that some should reach his nose, and as soon as they did he came to its relief by compressing it between his fingers, saying in a rather snuffing tone, Sancho, it strikes me thou art in great fear. I am, answered Sancho, but how does your worship perceive it now more than ever? Because just now thou smellest stronger than ever, and not of ambergris, answered Don Quixote. Very likely, said Sancho, but that's not my fault, but your worship's, for leading me about at unseasonable hours and at such unwanted paces. Then go back three or four, my friend, said Don Quixote, all the time with his fingers to his nose, and for the future pay more attention to thy person and to what thou owest to mine, for it is my great familiarity with thee that has bred this contempt. I'll bet, replied Sancho, that your worship thinks I have done something out not with my person. It makes it worse to stir it, friend Sancho, returned Don Quixote. With this and other talk of the same sort master and man passed the night, till Sancho, perceiving that daybreak was coming on apace, very cautiously untied Rocinante and tied up his breeches. As soon as Rocinante found himself free, though by nature he was not at all meddlesome, he seemed to feel lively and began pawing, for as to capering, begging his pardon he knew not what it meant. Don Quixote, then, observing that Rocinante could move, took it as a good sign and a signal that he should attempt the dread adventure. By this time day had fully broken and everything showed distinctly, and Don Quixote saw that he was among some tall trees, chestnuts, which cast a very deep shade, he perceived likewise that the sound of the strokes did not cease, but could not discover what caused it, and so without any further delay he let Rocinante feel the spur, and once more taking leave of Sancho, he told him to wait for him there three days at most, as he had said before, and if he should not have returned by that time, he might feel sure it had been God's will that he should end his days in that perilous adventure. He again repeated the message and commission with which he was to go on his behalf to his lady Dulcinea, and said he was not to be uneasy as to the payment of his services, for before leaving home he had made his will, in which he would find himself fully recompensed in the matter of wages in due proportion to the time he had served. But if God delivered him safe, sound, and unhurt out of that danger, he might look upon the promised island as much more than certain. Sancho began to weep afresh on again hearing the affecting words of his good master, and resolved to stay with him until the final issue and end of the business. From these tears and this honourable resolve of Sancho Pons as the author of this history infers that he must have been of good birth and at least an old Christian, and the feeling he displayed touched his but not so much as to make him show any weakness, on the contrary, hiding what he felt as well as he could, he began to move towards that quarter whence the sound of the water and end of the strokes seemed to come. Sancho followed him on foot, leading by the halter, as his custom was, his ass, his constant comrade in prosperity or adversity, and advancing some distance through the shady chestnut trees they came upon a little meadow at the foot of some high rocks, down which a mighty rush of water flung itself. At the foot of the rocks were some rudely constructed houses looking more like ruins than houses, from among which came, they perceived, the din and clatter of blows, which still continued without intermission. Rocinante took fright at the noise of the water and of the blows, but quieting him Don Quixote advanced step by step towards the houses, commending himself with all his heart to his lady, imploring her support in that dread pass and enterprise, and on the way commending himself to God, too, not to forget him. Sancho who never quitted his side, stretched his neck as far as he could and peered between the legs of Rocinante to see if he could now discover what it was that caused him such fear and apprehension. They went it might be a hundred paces farther, when on turning a corner the true cause, beyond the possibility of any mistake, of that dread sounding into them awe-inspiring noise that had kept them all the night in such fear and perplexity, appeared plain and obvious, and it was, if, reader, thou art not disgusted and disappointed, six fulling hammers which by their alternate strokes made all the din. When Don Quixote perceived what it was, he was struck dumb and rigid from head to foot. Sancho glanced at him and saw him with his head bent down upon his breast in manifest mortification, and Don Quixote glanced at Sancho and saw him with his cheeks puffed out and his mouth full of laughter, and evidently ready to explode with it, and in spite of his vexation he could not help laughing at the sight of him, and when Sancho saw his master begin he let go so heartily that he had to hold his sides with both hands to keep himself from bursting with laughter. Four times he stopped, and as many times did his laughter break out afresh with the same violence as at first, whereat Don Quixote grew furious, above all when he heard him say mockingly, Thou must know, friend Sancho, that of heaven's will I was born in this our iron age to revive in it the golden or age of gold. I am he for whom are reserved perils, mighty achievements, valiant deeds, and here he went on repeating the words that Don Quixote uttered the first time they heard the awful strokes. Don Quixote, then, seeing that Sancho was turning him into ridicule, was so mortified and vexed that he lifted up his pike and smote him two such blows that if, instead of catching them on his shoulders, he had caught them on his head there would have been no wages to pay, 
unless indeed to his heirs. Sancho seeing that he was getting an awkward return in earnest for his jest, and fearing his master might carry it still further, said to him very humbly, Come yourself, sir, for by God I am only joking. Well, then, if you are joking I am not, replied Don Quixote. Look here, my lively gentleman, if these, instead of being fulling hammers, had been some perilous adventure, have I not, think you, shown the courage required for the attempt and achievement? Am I, perchance, being, as I am, a gentleman, bound to know and distinguish sounds and tell whether they come from fulling mills or not, and that, when perhaps, as is the case, I have never in my life seen any as you have, low bore as you are, that have been born and bred among them? But turn me these six hammers into six giants, and bring them to beard me, one by one or all together, and if I do not knock them head over heels, then make what mockery you like of me. No more of that, senor, returned Sancho, I own I went a little too far with the joke. But tell me, your worship, now that peace is made between us, and may God bring you out of all the adventures that may befall you as safe and sound as he has brought you out of this one, was it not a thing to laugh at, and is it not a good story, the great fear we were in? At least that I was in, for as to your worship I see now that you neither know nor understand what either fear or dismay is. I do not deny, said Don Quixote, that what happened to us may be worth laughing at, but it is not worth making a story about, for it is not every one that is shrewd enough to hit the right point of a thing. At any rate, said Sancho, your worship knew how to hit the right point with your pike, aiming at my head and hitting me on the shoulders, thanks be to God and my own smartness in dodging it. But let that pass, all will come out in the scouring, for I have heard say he loves thee well that makes thee weep, and moreover that it is the way with great lords after any hard words they give a servant to give him a pair of breeches, though I do not know what they give after blows, unless it be that knights errant after blows give islands or kingdoms on the mainland. It may be on the dice, said Don Quixote, that all thou sayest will come true, overlook the past, for thou art shrewd enough to know that our first movements are not in our own control, and one thing for the future bear in mind, that thou curb and restrain thy loquacity in my company, for in all the books of chivalry that I have read, and they are innumerable, I never met with a squire who talks so much to his lord as thou dost to thine, and in fact I feel it to be a great fault of thine and of mine, of thine, that thou hast so little respect for me, of mine, that I do not make myself more respected. There was Gandolin, the squire of Amadis of Gaul, that was count of the Insula Firme, and we read of him that he always addressed his lord with his cap in his hand, his head bowed down and his body bent double, more Turquesco. And then, what shall we say of Gasabal, the squire of Galar, who was so silent that in order to indicate to us the greatness of his marvellous taciturnity his name is only once mentioned in the whole of that history, as long as it is truthful. From all I have said thou wilt gather, Sancho, that there must be a difference between master and man, between lord and lackey, between knight and squire, so that from this day forward in our intercourse we must observe more respect and take less liberties, for in whatever way I may be provoked with you it will be bad for the pitcher. The favours and benefits that I have promised you will come in due time, and if they do not your wages at least will not be lost, as I have already told you. All that your worship says is very well, said Sancho, but I should like to know, in case the time of favour should not come, and it might be necessary to fall back upon wages, how much did the squire of a knight-errant get in those days, and did they agree by the month, or by the day like bricklayers? I do not believe, replied Don Quixote, that such squires were ever on wages, but were dependent on favour, and if I have now mentioned thine in the sealed will I have left at home, it was with a view to what may happen, for as yet I know not how chivalry will turn out in these wretched times of ours, and I do not wish my soul to suffer for trifles in the other world, for I would have thee know, Sancho, that in this there is no condition more hazardous than that of adventurers. That is true, said Sancho, since the mere noise of the hammers of a fulling mill can disturb and disquiet the heart of such a valiant errant adventurer as your worship, but you may be sure I will not open my lips henceforward to make light of anything of your worships, but only to honour you as my master and natural lord. By so doing, replied Don Quixote, shalt thou live long on the face of the earth, for next to parents, masters are to be respected as though they were parents. Chapter 21 Which treats of the exalted adventure and rich prize of Mambrino's helmet, together with other things that happened to our invincible knight. It now began to rain a little, and Sancho was for going into the fulling mills, but Don Quixote had taken such an abhorrence to them on account of the late joke that he would not enter them on any account, so turning aside to right they came upon another road, different from that which they had taken the night before. Shortly afterwards Don Quixote perceived a man on horseback who wore on his head something that shone like gold, and the moment he saw him he turned to Sancho and said, I think, Sancho, there is no proverb that is not true, 
all being maxims drawn from experience itself, the mother of all the sciences, especially that one that says, where one door shuts, another opens. I say so because if last night fortune shut the door of the adventure we were looking for against us, cheating us with the fulling mills, it now opens wide another one for another better and more certain adventure, and if I do not contrive to enter it, it will be my own fault, and I cannot lay it to my ignorance of fulling mills, or the darkness of the night. I say this because, if I mistake not, there comes towards us one who wears on his head the helmet of Mombrino, concerning which I took the oath thou rememberest. Mind what you say, your worship, and still more what you do, said Sancho, for I don't want any more fulling mills to finish off fulling and knocking our senses out. The devil take thee, man, said Don Quixote, what has a helmet to do with fulling mills? I don't know, replied Sancho, but, faith, if I might speak as I used, perhaps I could give such reasons that your worship would see you were mistaken in what you say. How can I be mistaken in what I say, unbelieving traitor? Returned Don Quixote, tell me, seest thou not yonder knight coming towards us on a dappled grey steed, who has upon his head a helmet of gold? What I see and make out, answered Sancho, is only a man on a grey ass like my own, who has something that shines on his head. Well, that is the helmet of Mombrino, said Don Quixote, stand to one side and leave me alone with him, thou shalt see how, without saying a word, to save time, I shall bring this adventure to an issue and possess myself of the helmet I have so longed for. I will take care to stand aside, said Sancho, but God grant, I say once more, that it may be marjoram and not fulling mills. I have told thee, brother, on no account to mention those fulling mills to me again, said Don Quixote, or I vow, and I say no more, I'll full the soul out of you. Sancho held his peace in dread lest his master should carry out the vow he had hurled like a bowl at him. The fact of the matter as regards the helmet, steed, and knight that Don Quixote saw, was this. In that neighborhood there were two villages, one of them so small that it had neither apothecary's shop nor barber, which the other that was close to it had, so the barber of the larger served the smaller, and in it there was a sick man who required to be bled and another man who wanted to be shaved, and on this errand the barber was going, carrying with him a brass basin, but his luck would have it, as he was on the way it began to rain, and not to spoil his hat, which probably was a new one, he put the basin on his head, and being clean it glittered at half a league's distance. He rode upon a grey ass, as Sancho said, and this was what made it seem to Don Quixote to be a dapple grey steed and a knight in a golden helmet, for everything he saw he made to fall in with his crazy chivalry and ill-errant notions, and when he saw the poor knight draw near, without entering into any parley with him, at Rocinante's top speed he bore down upon him with the pike pointed low, fully determined to run him through and through, and as he reached him, without checking the fury of his charge, he cried to him, Defend thyself, miserable being, or yield me of thine own accord that which is so reasonably my due. The barber, who without any expectation or apprehension of it saw this apparition coming down upon him, had no other way of saving himself from the stroke of the lance but to let himself fall off his ass, and no sooner had he touched the ground than he sprang up more nimbly than a deer and sped away across the plain faster than the wind. He left the basin on the ground, with which Don Quixote contented himself, saying that the pagan had shown his discretion and imitated the beaver, which finding itself pressed by the hunter's bites and cuts off with its teeth that for which, by its natural instinct, it knows it is pursued. He told Sancho to pick up the helmet, and he taking it in his hand said, By God the basin is a good one, and worth a real of eight if it is worth a maravedis, and handed it to his master, who immediately put it on his head, turning it round, now this way, now that, in search of fitment, and not finding it he said, clearly the pagan to whose measure this famous headpiece was first forged must have had a very large head, but the worst of it is half of it is wanting. When Sancho heard him call the basin a headpiece he was unable to restrain his laughter, but remembering his master's wrath he checked himself in the midst of it. What art thou laughing at, Sancho? said Don Quixote. I am laughing, said he, think of the great head the pagan must have had who owned this helmet, for it looks exactly like a regular barber's basin. Dost thou know what I suspect, Sancho? said Don Quixote, that this wonderful piece of this enchanted helmet must by some strange accident have come into the hands of some one who was unable to recognize or realize its value, and who, not knowing what he did, and seeing it to be of the purest gold, must have melted down one half for the sake of what it might be worth, and of the other made this which is like a barber's basin as thou sayest, but be it as it may, to me who recognize it, its transformation makes no difference, for I will set it to rights at the first village where there is a blacksmith, and in such style that that helmet the god of smithies forged for the god of battles shall not surpass it or even come up to it, and in the meantime I will wear it as well as I can, for something is better than nothing, all the more as it will be quite enough to protect me from any chance blow of a stone. 
That is, said Sancho, if it is not shot with a sling as they were in the battle of the two armies, when they signed the cross on your worship's grinders and smashed the flask with that blessed draught that made me vomit my bowels up. It does not grieve me much to have lost it, said Don Quixote, for thou knowest, Sancho, that I have the receipt in my memory. So have I, answered Sancho, but if ever I make it, or try it again as long as I live, may this be my last hour, moreover, I have no intention of putting myself in the way of wanting it, for I mean, with all my five senses, to keep myself from being wounded or from wounding anyone, as to being blanketed again I say nothing, for it is hard to prevent mishaps of that sort, and if they come there is nothing for it but to squeeze our shoulders together, hold our breath, shut our eyes, and let ourselves go where luck and the blanket may send us. Thou art a bad Christian, Sancho, said Don Quixote on hearing this, for once an injury has been done thee thou never forgettest it, but know that it is the part of noble and generous hearts not to attach importance to trifles. What lame leg hast thou got by it, what broken rib, what cracked head, that thou canst not forget that jest? For jest and sport it was, properly regarded, and had I not seen it in that light I would have returned and done more mischief in revenging thee than the Greeks did for the rape of Helen, who, if she were alive now, or if my Dulcinea had lived then, might depend upon it she would not be so famous for her beauty as she is, and here he heaved a sigh and sent it aloft, and said Sancho, let it pass for a jest as it cannot be revenged in earnest, but I know what sort of jest and earnest it was, and I know it will never be rubbed out of my memory any more than off my shoulders. But putting that aside, will your worship tell me what are we to do with this dapple grey steed that looks like a grey ass, which that Martino that your worship overthrew has left deserted here? For, from the way he took to his heels and bolted, he is not likely ever to come back for it, and by my beard but the grey is a good one. I have never been in the habit, said Don Quixote, of taking spoil of those whom I vanquish, nor is it the practice of chivalry to take away their horses and leave them to go on foot, unless indeed it be that the victor have lost his own in the combat, in which case it is lawful to take that of the vanquished as a thing won in lawful war. Therefore, Sancho, leave this horse, or ass, or whatever thou wilt have it to be, for when its owner sees us gone hence he will come back for it. God knows I should like to take it, return Sancho, or at least to change it for my own, which does not seem to me as good a one, verily the laws of chivalry are strict, since they cannot be stretched to let one ass be changed for another, I should like to know if I might at least change trappings. On that head I am not quite certain, answered Don Quixote, and the matter being doubtful, pending better information, I say thou mayest change them, if so be thou hast urgent need of them. So urgent is it, answered Sancho, that if they were for my own person I could not want them more, and forthwith, fortified by this license, he effected the mutatio caparum, rigging out his beast to the ninety-nines and making quite another thing of it. This done, they broke their fast on the remains of the spoils of war plundered from the sumpter mule, and drank of the brook that flowed from the fulling mills, without casting a look in that direction, in such loathing did they hold them for the alarm they had caused them, and, all anger and gloom removed, they mounted and, without taking any fixed road, not to fix upon any being the proper thing for true knights errant, they set out, guided by Rocinante's will, which carried along with it that of his master, not to say that of the ass, which always followed him wherever he led, lovingly and sociably, nevertheless they returned to the high road, and pursued it at a venture without any other aim. As they went along, then, in this way Sancho said to his master, Senor, would your worship give me leave to speak a little to you? For since you laid that hard injunction of silence on me several things have gone to rot in my stomach, and I have now just one on the tip of my tongue that I don't want to be spoiled. Say, on, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and be brief in thy discourse, for there is no pleasure in one that is long. Well then, Senor, returned Sancho, I say that for some days past I have been considering how little is got or gained by going in search of these adventures that your worship seeks in these wilds and crossroads, where, even if the most perilous are victoriously achieved, there is no one to see or know of them, and so they must be left untold for ever, to the loss of your worship's object and the credit they deserve, therefore it seems to me it would be better, saving your worship's better judgment, if we were to go and serve some emperor or other great prince who may have some war on hand, in whose service your worship may prove the worth of your person, your great might, and greater understanding, on perceiving which the Lord in whose service we may be will perforce have to reward us, each according to his merits, and there you will not be at a loss for someone to set down your achievements in writing so as to preserve their memory for ever. Of my own I say nothing, as they will not go beyond squirely limits, though I make bold to say that, if it be the practice in chivalry to write the achievements of squires, I think mine must not be left out. Thou speakest not amiss, Sancho, answered Don Quixote, but before that point is reached it is requisite to roam the world, as it were on probation, seeking adventures, in order that, 
by achieving some, name and fame may be acquired, such that when he betakes himself to the court of some great monarch the knight may be already known by his deeds, and that the boys, the instant they see him enter the gate of the city, may all follow him and surround him, crying, This is the knight of the sun or the serpent, or any other title under which he may have achieved great deeds. This, they will say, is he who vanquished in single combat the gigantic Brocabruno of mighty strength, he who delivered the great Mameluke of Persia out of the long enchantment under which he had been for almost nine hundred years. So from one to another they will go proclaiming his achievements, and presently at the tumult of the boys and the others the king of that kingdom will appear at the windows of his royal palace, and as soon as he beholds the knight, recognizing him by his arms and the device on his shield, he will as a matter of course say, What ho! Forth all ye, the knights of my court, to receive the flower of chivalry who cometh hither. At which command all will issue forth, and he himself, advancing halfway down the stairs, will embrace him closely, and salute him, kissing him on the cheek, and will then lead him to the queen's chamber, where the knight will find her with the princess her daughter, who will be one of the most beautiful and accomplished damsels that could with the utmost pains be discovered anywhere in the known world. Straightway it will come to pass that she will fix her eyes upon the knight and he is upon her, and each will seem to the other something more divine than human, and, without knowing how or why they will be taken and entangled in the inextricable toils of love, and sorely distressed in their hearts not to see any way of making their pains and sufferings known by speech. Thence they will lead him, no doubt, to some richly adorned chamber of the palace, where, having removed his armour, they will bring him a rich mantle of scarlet wherewith to robe himself, and if he looked noble in his armour he will look still more so in a doublet. When night comes he will sup with the king, queen, and princess, and all the time he will never take his eyes off her, stealing stealthy glances, unnoticed by those present, and she will do the same, and with equal cautiousness, being, as I have said, a damsel of great discretion. The tables being removed, suddenly through the door of the hall there will enter a hideous and diminutive dwarf followed by a fair dame, between two giants, who comes with a certain adventure, the work of an ancient sage, and he who shall achieve it shall be deemed the best knight in the world. The king will then command all those present to essay it, and none will bring it to an end and conclusion save the stranger knight, to the great enhancement of his fame, whereat the princess will be overjoyed and will esteem herself happy and fortunate in having fixed and placed her thoughts so high. And the best of it is that this king, or prince, or whatever he is, is engaged in a very bitter war with another as powerful as himself, and the stranger knight, after having been some days at his court, requests leave from him to go and serve him in the said war. The king will grant it very readily and the knight will courteously kiss his hands for the favour done to him, and that night he will take leave of his lady the princess at the grating of the chamber where she sleeps, which looks upon a garden, and at which he has already many times conversed with her, the go-between and confidant in the matter being a damsel much trusted by the princess. He will sigh, she will swoon, the damsel will fetch water, much distressed because morning approaches, and for the honour of her lady he would not that they were discovered, at last the princess will come to herself and will present her white hands through the grating to the knight, who will kiss them a thousand and a thousand times, bathing them with his tears. It will be arranged between them how they are to inform each other of their good or evil fortunes, and the princess will entreat him to make his absence as short as possible, which he will promise to do with many oaths, once more he kisses her hands, and takes his leave in such grief that he is well nigh ready to die. He betakes him thence to his chamber, flings himself on his bed, cannot sleep for sorrow at parting, rises early in the morning, goes to take leave of the king, queen, and princess, and, as he takes his leave of the pair, it is told him that the princess is indisposed and cannot receive a visit, the knight thinks it is from grief at his departure, his heart is pierced, and he is hardly able to keep from showing his pain. The confidant is present, observes all, goes to tell her mistress, who listens with tears and says that one of her greatest distresses is not knowing who this knight is, and whether he is of kingly lineage or not, the damsel assures her that so much courtesy, gentleness and gallantry of bearing as her knight possesses could not exist in any save one who was royal and illustrious. Her anxiety is thus relieved, and she strives to be of good cheer lest she should excite suspicion in her parents, and at the end of two days she appears in public. Meanwhile the knight has taken his departure, he fights in the war, conquers the king's enemy, wins many cities, triumphs in many battles, returns to the court, sees his lady where he was wont to see her, and it is agreed that he shall demand her in marriage of her parents as the reward of his services the king is unwilling to give her, as he knows not who he is, but nevertheless, whether carried off or in whatever other way it may be, the princess comes to be his bride, and her father comes to regard it as very good fortune, for it so happens that this knight is proved to be the son of a valiant king of some kingdom, I know not what, for I fancy it is not likely to be on the map. The father dies, the princess inherits, and in two words the knight becomes king. 
and here comes in at once the bestowal of rewards upon his squire and all who have aided him in rising to so exalted a rank. He marries his squire to a damsel of the princesses, who will be, no doubt, the one who was confidant in their amour, and is daughter of a very great duke. That's what I want, and no mistake about it, said Sancho. That's what I'm waiting for, for all this, word for word, is in store for your worship under the title of the Knight of the Rueful Countenance. Thou needst not doubt it, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, for in the same manner, and by the same steps as I have described here, knights errant rise and have risen to be kings and emperors, all we want now is to find out what king, Christian or pagan, is at war and has a beautiful daughter, but there will be time enough to think of that, for, as I have told thee, fame must be won in other quarters before repairing to the court. There is another thing, too, that is wanting, for supposing we find a king who is at war and has a beautiful daughter, and that I have won incredible fame throughout the universe, I know not how it can be made out that I am of royal lineage, or even second cousin to an emperor, for the king will not be willing to give me his daughter in marriage unless he is first thoroughly satisfied on this point, however much my famous deeds may deserve it, so that by this deficiency I fear I shall lose what my arm has fairly earned. True it is I am a gentleman of known house, of estate and property, and entitled to the five hundred soldos mulked, and it may be that the sage who shall write my history will so clear up my ancestry and pedigree that I may find myself fifth or sixth in descent from a king, for I would have thee know, Sancho, that there are two kinds of lineages in the world, some there be tracing and deriving their descent from kings and princes, whom time has reduced little by little until they end in a point like a pyramid upside down, and others who spring from the common herd and go on rising step by step until they come to be great lords, so that the difference is that the one were what they no longer are, and the others are what they formerly were not. And I may be of such that after investigation my origin may prove great and famous, with which the king, my father-in-law that is to be, ought to be satisfied, and should he not be, the princess will so love me that even though she well knew me to be the son of a water carrier, she will take me for her lord and husband in spite of her father, if not, then it comes to seizing her and carrying her off where I please, for time or death will put an end to the wrath of her parents. It comes to this, too, said Sancho, what some naughty people say, never ask as a favour what thou canst take by force, though it would fit better to say, a clear escape is better than good men's prayers. I say so because if my lord the king, your worship's father-in-law, will not condescend to give you my lady the princess, there is nothing for it but, as your worship says, to seize her and transport her. But the mischief is that until peace is made and you come into the peaceful enjoyment of your kingdom, the poor squire is famishing as far as rewards go, unless it be that the confidant damsel that is to be his wife comes with the princess, and that with her he tides over his bad luck until heaven otherwise orders things, for his master, I suppose, may as well give her to him at once for a lawful wife. Nobody can object to that, said Don Quixote. Then since that may be, said Sancho, there is nothing for it but to commend ourselves to God, and let fortune take what course it will. God guide it according to my wishes and thy wants, said Don Quixote, and mean be he who thinks himself mean. In God's name let him be so, said Sancho, I am an old Christian, and to fit me for account that's enough. And more than enough for thee, said Don Quixote, and even wert thou not, it would make no difference, because I being the king can easily give thee nobility without purchase or service rendered by thee, for when I make the account, then thou art at once a gentleman, and they may say what they will, but by my faith they will have to call thee your lordship, whether they like it or not. Not a doubt of it, and I'll know how to support the tittle, said Sancho. Title thou shouldst say, not tittle, said his master. So be it, answered Sancho. I say I will know how to behave, for once in my life I was beetle of a brotherhood and the beetle's gown sat so well on me that all said I looked as if I was to be steward of the same brotherhood. What will it be, then, when I put a duke's robe on my back, or dress myself in gold and pearls like a count? I believe they'll come a hundred leagues to see me. Thou wilt look well, said Don Quixote, but thou must shave thy beard often, for thou hast it so thick and rough and unkempt, that if thou dost not shave it every second day at least, they will see what thou art at the distance of a musket shot. What more will it be, said Sancho, than having a barber, and keeping him at wages in the house? And even if it be necessary, I will make him go behind me like a nobleman's equerry. Why, how dost thou know that noblemen have equerries behind them? asked Don Quixote. I will tell you, answered Sancho. Years ago I was for a month at the capital and there I saw taking the air a very small gentleman who they said was a very great man, and a man following him on horseback in every turn he took, just as if he was his tail. I asked why this man did not join the other man, instead of always going behind him, they answered me that he was his equerry, and that it was the custom with nobles to have such persons behind them, and ever since then I know it, for I have never forgotten it. 
Thou art right, said Don Quixote, and in the same way thou mayest carry thy barber with thee, for customs did not come into use altogether, nor were they all invented at once, and thou mayest be the first count to have a barber to follow him, and, indeed, shaving one's beard is a greater trust than saddling one's horse. Let the barber business be my lookout, said Sancho, and your worships be it to strive to become a king, and make me a count. So it shall be, answered Don Quixote, and raising his eyes he saw what will be told in the following chapter. Chapter 22 Of the freedom Don Quixote conferred on several unfortunates who against their will were being carried where they had no wish to go. Sidamete Benengeli, the Arab and Manchegan author, relates in this most grave, high-sounding, minute, delightful, and original history that after the discussion between the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha and his squire Sancho Panza which is set down at the end of chapter 21, Don Quixote raised his eyes and saw coming along the road he was following some dozen men on foot strung together by the neck, like beads, on a great iron chain, and all with manacles on their hands. With them there came also two men on horseback and two on foot, those on horseback with will lock muskets, those on foot with javelins and swords, and as soon as Sancho saw them he said, That is a chain of galley slaves, on the way to the galleys by force of the king's orders. How by force? asked Don Quixote, is it possible that the king uses force against anyone? I do not say that, answered Sancho, but that these are people condemned for their crimes to serve by force in the king's galleys. In fact, replied Don Quixote, however it may be, these people are going where they are taking them by force, and not of their own will. Just so, said Sancho. Then if so, said Don Quixote, here is a case for the exercise of my office, to put down force and to succor and help the wretched. Recollect, your worship, said Sancho, justice, which is the king himself, is not using force or doing wrong to such persons, but punishing them for their crimes. The chain of galley slaves had by this time come up, and Don Quixote in very courteous language asked those who were in custody of it to be good enough to tell him the reason or reasons for which they were conducting these people in this manner. One of the guards on horseback answered that they were galley slaves belonging to his majesty, that they were going to the galleys, and that was all that was to be said and all he had any business to know. Nevertheless, replied Don Quixote, I should like to know from each of them separately the reason of his misfortune. To this he added more to the same effect to induce them to tell him what he wanted so civilly that the other mounted guard said to him. Though we have here the register and certificate of the sentence of every one of these wretches, this is no time to take them out or read them, come and ask themselves, they can tell if they choose, and they will, for these fellows take a pleasure in doing and talking about rascalities. With this permission, which Don Quixote would have taken even had they not granted it, he approached the chain and asked the first for what offences he was now in such a sorry case. He made answer that it was for being a lover. For that only? replied Don Quixote, why, if for being lovers they send people to the galleys I might have been rowing in them long ago. The love is not the sort your worship is thinking of, said the galley slave, mine was that I loved a washerwoman's basket of clean linen so well, and held it so close in my embrace, that if the arm of the law had not forced it from me, I should never have let it go of my own will to this moment. I was caught in the act, there was no occasion for torture, the case was settled, they treated me to a hundred lashes on the back, and three years of garapas besides, and that was the end of it. What are garapas? asked Don Quixote. Garapas are galleys, answered the galley slave, who was a young man of about four and twenty, and said he was a native of Piedrahita. Don Quixote asked the same question of the second, who made no reply, so downcast and melancholy was he, but the first answered for him, and said, he, sir, goes as a canary, I mean as a musician and a singer. What, said Don Quixote, for being musicians and singers are people sent to the galleys too? Yes, sir, answered the galley slave, for there is nothing worse than singing under suffering. On the contrary, I have heard say, said Don Quixote, that he who sings scares away his woes. Here it is the reverse, said the galley slave, for he who sings once weeps all his life. I do not understand it, said Don Quixote. But one of the guards said to him, Sir, to sing under suffering means with the non sancta fraternity to confess under torture. They put this sinner to the torture and he confessed his crime, which was being a quatrero, that is a cattle stealer, and on his confession they sentenced him to six years in the galleys, besides two hundred lashes that he has already had on the back, and he is always dejected and downcast because the other thieves that were left behind and that march here ill treat, and snub, and jeer, and despise him for confessing and not having spirit enough to say nay, for, say they, nay has no more letters in it than yea, and a culprit is well off when life or death with him depends on his own tongue and not on that of witnesses or evidence, and to my thinking they are not very far out. 
And I think so too, answered Don Quixote, then passing on to the third he asked him what he had asked the others, and the man answered very readily and unconcernedly, I am going for five years to their ladyships the Garapas for the one of ten ducats. I will give twenty with pleasure to get you out of that trouble, said Don Quixote. That, said the galley slave, is like a man having money at sea when he is dying of hunger and has no way of buying what he wants, I say so because if at the right time I had had those twenty ducats that your worship now offers me, I would have greased the notary's pen and freshened up the attorney's wit with them, so that today I should be in the middle of the plaza of the Zocodover at Toledo, and not on this road coupled like a greyhound. But God is great, patience, there, that's enough of it. Don Quixote passed on to the fourth, a man of venerable aspect with a white beard falling below his breast, who on hearing himself ask the reason of his being there began to weep without answering a word, but the fifth acted as his tongue and said, this worthy man is going to the galleys for four years, after having gone the rounds in ceremony and on horseback. That means, said Sancho Panza, as I take it, to have been exposed to shame in public. Just so, replied the galley slave, and the offence for which they gave him that punishment was having been an ear broker, nay body broker, I mean, in short, that this gentleman goes as a pimp, and for having besides a certain touch of the sorcerer about him. If that touch had not been thrown in, said Don Quixote, he would not deserve, for mere pimping, to row in the galleys, but rather to command and be admiral of them, for the office of pimp is no ordinary one, being the office of persons of discretion, one very necessary in a well-ordered state, and only to be exercised by persons of good birth, nay, there ought to be an inspector and overseer of them, as in other offices, and recognized number, as with the brokers on change, in this way many of the evils would be avoided which are caused by this office and calling being in the hands of stupid and ignorant people, such as women more or less silly, and pages and gestures of little standing and experience, who on the most urgent occasions, and when ingenuity of contrivance is needed, let the crumbs freeze on the way to their mouths, and know not which is their right hand. I should like to go farther, and give reasons to show that it is advisable to choose those who are to hold so necessary an office in the state, but this is not the fit place for it. Some day I will expound the matter to some one able to see to and rectify it. All I say now is, that the additional fact of his being a sorcerer has removed the sorrow it gave me to see these white hairs and this venerable countenance in so painful a position on account of his being a pimp. Though I know well there are no sorceries in the world that can move or compel the will as some simple folk fancy, for our will is free, nor is there herb or charm that can force it. All that certain silly women and quacks do is to turn men mad with potions and poisons, pretending that they have power to cause love, for, as I say, it is an impossibility to compel the will. It is true, said the good old man, and indeed, sir, as far as the charge of sorcery goes I was not guilty, as to that of being a pimp I cannot deny it, but I never thought I was doing any harm by it, for my only object was that all the world should enjoy itself and live in peace and quiet, without quarrels or troubles, but my good intentions were unavailing to save me from going where I never expect to come back from, with this weight of years upon me and a urinary ailment that never gives me a moment's ease, and again he fell to weeping as before, and such compassion did Sancho feel for him that he took out a reel of four from his bosom and gave it to him in alms. Don Quixote went on and asked another what his crime was, and the man answered with no less but rather much more sprightliness than the last one. I am here because I carried the joke too far with a couple of cousins of mine, and with a couple of other cousins who were none of mine, in short, I carried the joke so far with them all that it ended in such a complicated increase of kindred that no accountant could make it clear, it was all proved against me, I got no favour, I had no money, I was near having my neck stretched, they sentenced me to the galleys for six years, I accepted my fate, it is the punishment of my fault, I am a young man, let life only last, and with that all will come right. If you, sir, have anything wherewith to help the poor, God will repay it to you in heaven, and we on earth will take care in our petitions to him to pray for the life and health of your worship, that they may be as long and as good as your amiable appearance deserves. This one was in the dress of a student, and one of the guards said he was a great talker and a very elegant Latin scholar. Behind all these there came a man of thirty, a very personable fellow, except that when he looked, his eyes turned in a little one towards the other. He was bound differently from the rest, for he had to his leg a chain so long that it was wound all round his body, and two rings on his neck, one attached to the chain, the other to what they call a keep friend or friend's foot, from which hung two irons reaching to his waist with two manacles fixed to them in which his hands were secured by a big padlock, so that he could neither raise his hands to his mouth nor lower his head to his hands. Don Quixote asked why this man carried so many more chains than the others. The guard replied that it was because he alone had committed more crimes than all the rest put together, and was so daring and such a villain, that though they marched him in that fashion they did not feel sure of him, but were in dread of his making his escape. 
What crimes can he have committed, said Don Quixote, if they have not deserved a heavier punishment than being sent to the galleys? He goes for ten years, replied the guard, which is the same thing as civil death, and all that need be said is that this good fellow is the famous Anes de Passamonte, otherwise called Ginicilla de Parapilla. Gently, Senor Commissary, said the galley slave at this, let us have no fixing of names or surnames, my name is Anes, not Ginicillo, and my family name is Passamonte, not Parapilla as you say, let each one mind his own business, and he will be doing enough. Speak with less impertinence, master thief of extra measure, replied the commissary, if you don't want me to make you hold your tongue in spite of your teeth. It is easy to see, returned the galley slave, that man goes as God pleases, but someone shall know some day whether I am called Ginicillo de Parapilla or not. Don't they call you so, you liar? said the guard. They do, return Hines, but I will make them give over calling me so, or I will be shaved, where, I only say behind my teeth. If you, sir, have anything to give us, give it to us at once, and God speed you, for you are becoming tiresome with all this inquisitiveness about the lives of others. If you want to know about mine, let me tell you I am Hines de Passamonte, whose life is written by these fingers. He says true, said the commissary for he has himself written his story as grand as you please, and has left the book in the prison in pawn for two hundred reals. And I mean to take it out of pawn, said Hines, though it were in for two hundred ducats. Is it so good? said Don Quixote. So good is it, replied Hines, that a fig for Lazario de Tormes, and all of that kind that have been written, or shall be written compared with it, all I will say about it is that it deals with facts, and facts so neat and diverting that no lies could match them. And how is the book entitled? asked Don Quixote. The life of Hines de Passamonte, replied the subject of it. And is it finished? asked Don Quixote. How can it be finished, said the other, when my life is not yet finished? All that is written is from my birth down to the point when they sent me to the galleys this last time. Then you have been there before? said Don Quixote. In the service of God and the king I have been there for four years before now, and I know by this time what the biscuit and curbash are like, replied Hines and it is no great grievance to me to go back to them, for there I shall have time to finish my book, I have still many things left to say, and in the galleys of Spain there is more than enough leisure, though I do not want much for what I have to write, for I have it by heart. You seem a clever fellow, said Don Quixote. And an unfortunate one, replied Hines, for misfortune always persecutes good wit. It persecutes rogues, said the commissary. I told you already to go gently, master commissary, said Passamonte, their lordships yonder never gave you that staff to ill-treat us wretches here, but to conduct and take us where his majesty orders you, if not, by the life of never mind, it may be that some day the stains made in the inn will come out in the scouring, let every one hold his tongue and behave well and speak better, and now let us march on, for we have had quite enough of this entertainment. The commissary lifted his staff to strike Passamonte in return for his threats, but Don Quixote came between them, and begged him not to ill-use him, as it was not too much to allow one who had his hands tied to have his tongue a trifle free, and turning to the whole chain of them he said. From all you have told me, dear brethren, make out clearly that though they have punished you for your faults, the punishments you are about to endure do not give you much pleasure, and that you go to them very much against the grain and against your will, and that perhaps this one's one of courage under torture, that one's one of money, the other's one of advocacy, and lastly the perverted judgment of the judge may have been the cause of your ruin and of your failure to obtain the justice you had on your side all which presents itself now to my mind, urging, persuading, and even compelling me to demonstrate in your case the purpose for which heaven sent me into the world and caused me to make profession of the order of chivalry to which I belong, and the vow I took therein to give aid to those in need and under the oppression of the strong. But as I know that it is a mark of prudence not to do by foul means what may be done by fair, I will ask these gentlemen, the guards and commissary, to be so good as to release you and let you go in peace, as there will be no lack of others to serve the king under more favourable circumstances, for it seems to me a hard case to make slaves of those whom God and nature have made free. Moreover, sirs of the guard, added Don Quixote, these poor fellows have done nothing to you, let each answer for his own sins yonder, there is a God in heaven who will not forget to punish the wicked or reward the good, and it is not fitting that honest men should be the instruments of punishment to others, they being there in no way concerned. This request I make thus gently and quietly, that, if you comply with it, I may have reason for thanking you, and, if you will not voluntarily, this lance and sword together with the might of my arm shall compel you to comply with it by force. Nice nonsense, said the commissary, a fine piece of pleasantry he has come out with at last. He wants us to let the king's prisoners go, as if we had any authority to release them, or he to order us to do so. 
Go your way, sir, and good luck to you. Put that basin straight that you've got on your head, and don't go looking for three feet on a cat. Tis you that are the cat, rat, and rascal, replied Don Quixote, and acting on the word he fell upon him so suddenly that without giving him time to defend himself he brought him to the ground sorely wounded with a lance thrust, and lucky it was for him that it was the one that had the musket. The other guard stood thunderstruck and amazed at this unexpected event, but recovering presence of mind, those on horseback seized their swords, and those on foot their javelins, and attacked Don Quixote, who was waiting for them with great calmness, and no doubt it would have gone badly with him if the galley slaves, seeing the chance before them of liberating themselves, had not effected it by contriving to break the chain on which they were strung. Such was the confusion, that the guards, now rushing at the galley slaves who were breaking loose, now to attack Don Quixote who was waiting for them, did nothing at all that was of any use. Sancho, on his part, gave a helping hand to release Anesta Pasamonte, who was the first to leap forth upon the plain free and unfettered, and who, attacking the prostrate commissary, took from him his sword and the musket, with which, aiming at one and levelling at another, he, without ever discharging it, drove every one of the guards off the field, for they took to flight, as well to escape Pasamonte's musket, as the showers of stones the now released galley slaves were raining upon them. Sancho was greatly grieved at the affair, because he anticipated that those who had fled would report the matter to the Holy Brotherhood, who at the summons of the alarm bell would at once sally forth in quest of the offenders, and he said so to his master, and entreated him to leave the place at once, and go into hiding in the Sierra that was close by. That is all very well, said Don Quixote, but I know what must be done now, and calling together all the galley slaves, who were now running riot and had stripped the commissary to the skin, he collected them round him to hear what he had to say, and addressed them as follows, to be grateful for benefits received is the part of persons of good birth, and one of the sins most offensive to God is ingratitude. I say so because, sirs, ye have already seen by manifest proof the benefit ye have received of me, in return for which I desire, and it is my good pleasure that, laden with that chain which I have taken off your necks, ye at once set out and proceed to the city of El Toboso, and there present yourselves before the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso, and say to her that her knight, he of the rueful countenance, sends to commend himself to her, and that ye recount to her in full detail all the particulars of this notable adventure, up to the recovery of your longed for liberty, and this done ye may go where ye will. And good fortune attend you. Hanesta Pasamonte made answer for all, saying, That which you, sir, our deliverer, demand of us, is of all impossibilities the most impossible to comply with, because we cannot go together along the roads, but only singly and separate, and each one his own way, endeavouring to hide ourselves in the bowels of the earth to escape the Holy Brotherhood, which, no doubt, will come out in search of us. What your worship may do, and fairly do, is to change this service and tribute as regards the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso for a certain quantity of Ave Marias and Credos which we will say for your worship's intention, and this is a condition that can be complied with by night as by day, running or resting, in peace or in war, but to imagine that we are going now to return to the flesh pots of Egypt, I mean to take up our chain and set out for El Toboso, is to imagine that it is now night, though it is not yet ten in the morning, and to ask this of us is like asking pears of the elm tree. Then by all that's good, said Don Quixote, now stirred to wrath, Don son of a bitch, Don Ginesillo de Parapillo, or whatever your name is, you will have to go yourself alone, with your tail between your legs and the whole chain on your back. Pasamonte, who was anything but meek, being by this time thoroughly convinced that Don Quixote was not quite right in his head as he had committed such a vagary as to set them free, finding himself abused in this fashion, gave the wink to his companions, and falling back they began to shower stones on Don Quixote at such a rate that he was quite unable to protect himself with his buckler, and poor Rocinante no more heeded the spur than if he had been made of brass. Sancho planted himself behind his ass, and with him sheltered himself from the hailstorm that poured on both of them. Don Quixote was unable to shield himself so well but that more pebbles than I could count struck him full on the body with such force that they brought him to the ground, and the instant he fell the student pounced upon him, snatched the basin from his head, and with it struck three or four blows on his shoulders, and as many more on the ground, knocking it almost to pieces. They then stripped him of a jacket that he wore over his armour, and they would have stripped off his stockings if his greaves had not prevented them. From Sancho they took his coat, leaving him in his shirt sleeves, and dividing among themselves the remaining spoils of the battle, they went each one his own way, more solicitous about keeping clear of the holy brotherhood they dreaded, than about burdening themselves with the chain, or going to present themselves before the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso. The ass and Rocinante, Sancho and Don Quixote, were all that were left upon the spot, the ass with drooping head, serious, shaking his ears from time to time as if he thought the storm of stones that assailed them was not yet over, 
Rocinante stretched beside his master, for he too had been brought to the ground by a stone, Sancho stripped, and trembling with fear of the Holy Brotherhood, and Don Quixote fuming to find himself so served by the very persons for whom he had done so much.